Good morning and welcome to the sanctuary here at Somerset West United. Uh, we're preparing for the service that is going to be broadcast on Thursday the 13th and Sunday the 16th of August. Well, who can uh, expect that in the middle of August we would still be in some sort of form of lockdown? Listen now to Antoinette Beck as she reads from the Psalms for us. Good morning. I'm reading from Psalm 127 in the NIV. Unless the Lord builds the house, the laborers labor in vain. Unless the Lord watches over the city, the guards stand watch in vain. In vain you rise early and stay up late, toiling for food to eat, for he grants sleep to those he loves. Children are a heritage from the Lord, offspring a reward from him. Like arrows in the hands of a warrior are children born in one's youth. Blessed is the man whose quiver is full of them. They will not be put to shame when they contend with their opponents in court. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen. A manager and a sales rep stood looking at a map on which colored pins indicated the company representative in each area. I'm not going to fire you, Wilson, the manager said, but I'm loosening your pin just a little bit to emphasize the insecurity of your situation. It's a tough world out there. Business is business. It's cutthroat in the business world. These are all things that you hear said. In these last 22 years of being a pastor, I've heard some pretty terrible things about how people are treated in the business world. The way people act and the way people are treated, the hours that they're expected to work, the lengths to which people are expected to go to earn a living wage. Of course, this is even further exacerbated by the pressure placed on the workplace in this time of COVID-19 pandemic. Many have lost jobs and some are holding on to their jobs for dear life. Some, having kept their jobs, are working much harder than ever before because of all the others who've lost jobs. Something seems to have gone horribly wrong. The greatest work project of biblical history also went horribly wrong. Genesis 11 records a story about the people of the world who spoke just one common language, settling in the Fertile Crescent. Emboldened by their sense of self, they began to work on the construction of a great monument, a symbol of human prowess and a landmark for all the world to see the power of human engineering and achievement. They made bricks and mortar to hold these together. They built a city and then turned their effort toward this great tower. I don't think it would have been as high as the Empire State Building or the Burj Khalifa in Dubai. It was probably quite modest, but still the product of ambition and pride, a symbol of what humans were able to achieve. Well, all hell broke loose. Suddenly no one understood each other. Eugene Peterson writes, the unexcelled organization and enormous energy that were con concentrated in building the Tower of Babel resulted in such a shattering of community and garbled communication that civilization is still trying to recover. Babel is the story of work gone horribly wrong. Work without conscience, work without purpose, work to accumulate, possess, work which is in vain and seeks glory for ourselves. I think Western culture has taken over where Babel left off. Work is a major component of our lives. It is unavoidable and there's nothing wrong with that. But work can be good or bad. In Peterson's words, an area where our sin is magnified or where faith matures. So what's the problem with the way we work? Well, in short, 
There is no balance in us. We work too hard. We value work too much. We find too much self-esteem in our work. We are too focused on the fruits of our work. Work becomes too big a part of our lives. We deify human effort and not the God who enables us to work. The process becomes more important than the end result. We are persuaded that the authority and power we receive from our work roles makes us superior to others, more important in the eyes of others, more valuable to society. And of course we value some work more than others. Interestingly, the soccer player more than the frontline health worker. We think our competence gives us power over the earth, over things, over other people. Structures become more important than people. We care more for our possessions, with which we hope to make our way in the world, than with our thoughts and dreams, which tell us who we are in the world. And it is into this context that the psalmist writes, Unless the Lord builds the house, the builders labor in vain. There is another story of work in the Bible, and it is a story of a small Christian community who took the opposite extreme to Babel. These were the people who lived in the Greek city of Thessalonica. The people of Thessalonica had received the gospel when Paul presented it to them. They had received good teaching and a solid foundation from the apostles. But very soon a strange belief began to circulate among them. Since God has done everything in Christ and salvation has been received and achieved by Christ on the cross, and since Christians need do nothing except to receive the gift of grace, there was nothing more for them to do. The obvious and Christian solution was for them to quit their jobs and wait for the Lord to return. And so they sat around and did nothing. Unless the Lord builds the house, the builders labor in vain. Unless the Lord watches over the city, the watchmen stand guard in vain. So we are either workaholics or work avoiders. Either the sin of Babel or the sin of Thessalonica. Why can't we ever find a balance? The amazing premise of Psalm 127 is that God works. Almighty God, who has no one to make him work or expect him to work, no one to boss him around, works. Unless the Lord, who? The Lord builds the house. Unless the Lord watches over the city, it is the Lord who watches, not his servants, not his angels, not even his people, it is the Lord. You see, friends, we serve a Lord who builds and watches. Our God works. In fact, the Bible begins with this wonderful realization. In the beginning, God created. And it goes on to tell the story of the seven days of creation. And it was only at the end of the sixth day that the Lord rests. God did not sit and look pretty. God did not sit to be filled with glory and love. God created. God worked. And in Genesis 1, we find a journal of all God's work. The manifold beauty, the magnificent diversity of God's work. Christians read scripture and see God's wonderful work in Christ. So work is good just as God is good. But as with everything else in the world, sin can obscure a perfectly good thing. And so it seems that work has been obscured, skewed just as the beauty of the human body and sex and all those other things have been skewed. It's all about balance and about focus. Work loses focus when we lose touch with the God who works his salvation 
in the midst of the earth. So what should we remember about work? How can work, our work, be redeemed? Work is good. How can it be any other if God, who is goodness it himself, works? Work is good because it contributes to the upbuilding and renewing of society. Work is good because it develops and extends us as people. It helps us to grow. I can't tell you how different my life might have been had I not been involved in this particular work. Work has dignity. In the words of C.S. Lewis, the work of Beethoven and the work of the charwoman become spiritual on precisely the same condition, that of being offered to God, of being done humbly as to the Lord. This does not, of course, mean that it is for anyone a mere toss-up, whether he should sweep rooms or compose symphonies. A mole must dig to the glory of God and a cock must crow. Also, work has purpose. Nothing can be futile about work if God works. The question is, what is the purpose of your work and of mine? And I'm not only talking about the work we do for a salary, but the work we do in life, even the work we do for free or for charity or for others. Is the work to enrich or to share? Is it for self or for others? Is it to possess or to discover? Unless the Lord builds the house, writes the psalmist, the builders labor in vain. Unless the Lord watches over the city, the watchmen stand God in vain. So what about you? What about me? Why do we work? What is the purpose of our work? What is our motivation? Is my sin the sin of Babel or the sin of Thessalonica? Do you work to accumulate possessions and accomplishments? Or do you do what you do to make the world a better place? Who is the builder of your house? Maybe like the Thessalonians, you, shouldn't, you couldn't care less. Don't get tired of go doing good, Paul writes to the Thessalonians. Lead orderly lives and work to earn a living. The late Bruno Bettelheim, the famous American psychologist, once remarked, Never before have so many had it so good. No longer do we tremble in fear of sickness or hunger, of hidden evils in the dark, of the spell of witches. The burden of killing toil has been lifted from us. And machines, not the labor of our hands, will soon provide for us with nearly everything we need and much that we don't really need. We have inherited freedoms that man has striven after for centuries. Because of all this and much more, we should be living in a dawn of great promise. But now that we are freer to enjoy life, we are deeply frustrated in our own disappointment that the freedom and comfort sought with such deep desire do not give meaning and purpose to our lives. Work is good. We should learn to do it well. I sign this sermon as I always do. Solo Deo Gloria. To the glory of God. Amen.